Welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Bandit the Podcat. As we gain insights and hear stories straight from working preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, we talk with Jennifer Ackerman, author of Preaching the Gospel of Justice, Good News in Community, our 14th book in the series. Welcome, Jennifer. We're so glad that you could join us on our Working Preacher Books podcast. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here with you, Caroline and Rolf. Thanks for having me. We're so glad you're here. And it's our 14th book in the series. But let's, hey, this is your first book. It is my it's first always, book. That is just such an, that's a great moment. Uh, Fantastic. So please introduce yourself. Uh, tell our little, uh, tell our listeners a little about you. Sure. Um, my name is Jennifer Ackerman. I teach, uh, I'm an assistant professor of preaching at Fuller Seminary, and I also direct an institute for preaching Brem Preaching, the Lloyd John Ogilvie Initiative at Fuller, where we are really interested in the convergence of worship, preaching, and justice. So this book really was born out of my experience with students and with preachers all over the country who are thinking about all of these things all the time. Fantastic. Well, it seems like you are perfectly are suited, right, to write this book. So really enjoyed this book. Thank you for this wonderful edition. And I just want to start with a basic question, Jennifer. What would you say to those who feel uncomfortable when they hear preaching and justice in the same sentence, right? Uh, is it yeah. possible to define justice without resorting to, you know, those politically charged terms like woke uh, how do you how do you talk about that and navigate that in the book? Yeah, well, I, I think it's not only possible, but it's essential. I just don't know how we can read scripture and not see that we are loved by a God of justice, a God who wants the flourishing of all people, a God who is concerned about those who don't have a voice, those who are pushed to the margins, that the last shall be first. You know, everything that we see in scripture is about God trying to pull us away from the things that keep us self-centered. And I really think that's where um, even the good purposes of um, a political social justice agenda really ultimately is about how do I help my people? And what God is asking for is how we help all people. And sometimes that does mean taking a stand in social justice issues, but it's it's much bigger than all that. It's It's down, and it's also much smaller than that. It's the decisions that we make every day and the way that we um, live in relationship with people and the way that we try and move away from our own idols. All of that is is what we're seeing in biblical justice. And it's just something we have to talk about. Well, and I especially appreciated that basic claim, right, that justice preaching is scriptural. You know, we're not just we're not yeah. inserting something into scripture that it's present throughout. So thank you. You for that, right? Yeah, you you actually uh, talk about justice in the book, but you actually just used the term social justice a second ago. Mm -hmm. You never actually right that the word justice is all of the uh, the the Bible, but social justice never occurs. And so I uh, it's um I really like I like the expansiveness of the one word justice and how you really talk about especially the plural you church. And how um, that this sort of preaching focuses not less on individual redemption and more on communal transformation. Could you unpack that? Yeah, I just think that um, first of all, salvation is a wonderful thing. <laughs> individual personal redemption is so important and necessary, and we really can't live in community the way God is calling us to without that. So this is not an either or situation. This is definitely a both and. And I just think that um, there has been a trend in Christian preaching to emphasize the individual part. And we forget about the fact that if if all of this was just about our individual walk with Jesus, why would we be coming to church? <laughs> we could do that, really, on our own. We come, we are called to be communities that do this together and communities who figure out what life means 
when we live into the freedom of what we have because of that um, personal redemption and liberation. So it's about liberating us to not be so focused on our own selves. We're now free to be able to take up a different kind of mantle, a different kind of burden, which we can only really do when we're doing that in community. I wanted to go in a, a little bit different direction uh, with a question that I I just might have to borrow and give you credit <laughs> in my <laughs> in my t- teaching my beginning preaching class when you write that preaching is more than writing a sermon uh, and the way you put it is just so on target the call to preach is not a call to write a sermon. And that's one of the hardest things I think uh, for me to communicate to my students is that preaching is more than that sermon on Sunday and uh, mm-hmm. and and what what it, it involves. So where did where did that insight come from and why is that why is that important for our listeners to hear? Well I think that's it's something that was really steeped in me from my beginning as a student. I all really all of my preaching mentors operate in this kind of area of it's about formation of the preacher more than formation of the sermon. I mean, people like uh, Mark Laberton, Michael Pascarello, my first homiletics uh, teacher was Caroline Gordon, uh, who just talked about how we bring our whole selves into the pulpit. We bring every sermon we've ever heard. We bring the pain and the heartache of what we're going through. We bring the joy of what we're going through. We bring the, all the things that we're carrying. We bring that into the pulpit. And we have to then be constantly working really on ourselves in order to bring a sermon that's going to mean something for people. And so, um, yeah, with my students, they, I think I touched on this in the book, they, they want a plug and play option. Just tell me (laughs) the technique, how to fill in the blank for a perfect sermon. And I'm just like, it's not going to work that way. (laughs) So it's going to be messy. It's going to be hard where you're going to have to try things and fail. You're going to learn how to do things in different ways. And it's going to be a lifetime a lifetime formation. You're never going to just land there. It certainly will get easier and we'll have shortcuts and we'll have patterns that help us do it more efficiently maybe, but it's always going to be something where we're really struggling to listen to what God is saying to us and trying to do in us so that we can help facilitate a space where other people are open to making those same kinds of trials and errors throughout Mm -hmm. their own lives as well. And it seems to me too that with your where you're situated in your own professional career right now and uh, and particularly preaching and worship, there's also a connection there that right that preaching, you know the call to preach is then part of this larger experience of worship and community that it's not yes. you know people people don't go to sermons, they go to worship. <laughs> Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Although they will talk about whether they liked the preaching or not. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And as a matter of fact, at Fuller, just this year, we have uh, very begrudgingly, as a preaching faculty, been willing to try and teach preaching and worship an introduction to preaching and worship in one class, which we have said mm. that's impossible. We can't teach them everything they need to know about both these things. However, the plus side of that that I have seen is that students really are getting that you don't have to say everything in your 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 minute sermon. It's exactly. actually the whole worship space. And, and we're helping, the sermon is helping to facilitate this whole coming together of a community. And God is speaking in all those ways. And part of what we're doing as preachers is trying to connect the dots between the prayer of confession and the scripture mm. and the benediction. And that's, that's, that's an interesting thing to see students find connecting that as they're learning about worship and preaching at the same time. That's great. You know, you know that sparks two questions for me. The first is if you tie the everything you said so far about it's about transforming the community and it's a call to not write a sermon but be a preacher. Um that one's the preacher's relationship with the people. Mm-hmm. is essential. And it's why I think 
that after six years and having buried people and been with them through stuff, your preaching matters more. No, I would totally agree. And that's where in some ways I'm not a great person to talk about this because I am most of the time a guest in a congregation. Now, I do right now, for example, I'm spending a year in a sort of bridge pastor setting very part time with a church. And so then I I get to know them more. But you're right. That is it makes such a difference. And when you don't have those relationships, then I guess you play a slightly different role. I sometimes I think I'm sort of a drive by prophet. And there are things that I can say that maybe the regular every Sunday pastor can't say in the same way. And then you can do something a little differently. But for most of our working preachers who are doing this week after week, that's exactly right. It's it's the relationships that make all the difference in how the word is proclaimed on behalf of the community, truly on behalf of the community. Yeah, the line about a guest can say things that the regular can't say, that reminds me of a song by John Gorka about the gypsy life is people like you better when they know you're not going to be around very long. <laughs> Um, yeah. But so here, here's the uh, the deeper question, I suppose, out of what uh, you were all saying, which is, you talk in the book about a covenant of justice and the whole community, because uh, of course the covenant isn't with an individual; it's with the whole community in the Old Testament. So how can uh, how can preachers attend to the to the Old Testament, uh, Testament? Because the only two places in the Bible where the phrase "God of justice" occurs are both in the Old Testament. So uh, how does the Old Testament apply? Yeah, I, I think um, the Old Testament is where we learn from God's relationship with Israel, which is a relationship that we have been grafted into. And so we get to see how how God is working with people in a way that is so real to us. Like all these very human, everyday people who are called into something in the Old Testament, we just... We learn so much by looking at them. And one of the things I notice with student preachers in particular, but I see in um, working preachers as well, is this this desire to jump straight from an Old Testament scripture into Jesus. And um, of course, we do read the Old Testament in a new way because of our relationship with Jesus. But I, I'm always urging students, let that text speak for itself. Let us see what God is doing with Moses, with Miriam, with these characters there first. And then you can make the gospel, the, the New Testament tie in, because I think the truths of the gospel are all over the Old Testament and we just get to see it in a different kind of relationship that God has with us. Because it's a st- it's the same God. It's just we get to know God in a different way through Jesus. And so we Old Testament scriptures give us a chance to just look at different facets of what that relationship is that I think are really, really helpful. One of the things that was so helpful, I, I think, about this book is the, I mean, in particular, how you're casting this uh, within this uh, call to community, and uh, and how you you know how you we are called to be a plural you church that that what's at stake in this is the is our neighbor right and and that and and that uh, that call to be in community. The other thing that I think was so important is I loved how you talked about the difference between is preaching justice and doing justice an obligation or a delight mm-hmm. and and that uh that being in communion and being you know doing justice is mutual delight and you write uh, you write about this that suddenly a commitment to do justice is no longer a burden but a form of blessing and I and I, I think like we talked about earlier, immediately when people see a book like this, they're thinking, oh, what do I have to do? And and so could you say a little bit more about that for our listeners of that sense of of this 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 preaching justice and 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 delighting in, and how is it how are we delighting in justice? Yeah. Well, right away I just think of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount and, of course, the Beatitudes, which is an incredibly prophetic sermon that is 
all about justice, even though he doesn't use the word justice. Yeah. But, you know, saying, blessed are the meek, blessed are the persecuted, blessed are those who seek peace. And I think that when we learn, well, in the book, I use the, the First Nations version of that, where they look at um, it as what, what we have traditionally called the kingdom of God. First Nations version calls creator's good road. And when we are doing justice, I think that's a wonderful metaphor. When we're when we're committed to this doing justice, we're walking this road together. Mm -hmm. And how can we not delight in the community that is, in the fellowship that is, in the in uh the blessings that it brings to us. And walking a long, dirty, winding road is hard <laughs> and it is a burden. And when we do it with our family with our friends with our community it it becomes joy i mean we walk we walk all the time just for fun not because the walking <laughs> is necessarily the delight but because of all the things that we gain from it and and i think that's what this commitment to justice as a community can do for us you organized the book um around uh there's really four chapters three chapters in the conclusion um, and after each of the main chapters, there's a sermon, which is both printed in the book and then uh, available on YouTube. And they're not your sermons. Right. Which is interesting because, you know, uh, I probably would have used my own sermons, right? Because it's harder to go out and get the permission and get the manuscripts. So t tell about, uh, just say a word about that process of selecting those sermons. Yeah, that was actually the suggestion of a of a friend who I brought in to give me some editing advice. Um, she had kicked my butt to finish a dissertation, and so I thought she could help <laughs> me with this first book. And I felt like I was already sort of preaching through the whole book, and I sort of start each of those sections with a, a riff on a kind of sermon or, or scriptural meditation from me. And she said, well, what if you looked at what other people are doing and you helped us see this in other examples? And I just thought it was a great suggestion. And then just, it, just to help focus me on where I would find those, I looked at Fuller Chapel services, also because I thought it'd be easier to get permission. And because um, we just, <laughs> Fuller has a very diverse array of, of people preaching and speaking and um and so all I did, I started by just searching for sort of the key word for each of those chapters. And these four sermons just became very evident mm. um, that they were talking about exactly what I was trying to talk about. And then the fact that it happened to be three out of four are women of color who were doing just beautiful, amazing things. And to be able to show them alongside a very experienced, um, tall, white male pastor is how Mark describes himself often. And to be able to have all of those different ways of different contexts and 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 how they were using their individual giftings and voices as they brought to it, I just help i thought really brought another example of how we each come at this differently and how we need all these different voices to help us see things differently in your chapter on on um prophetic preaching it was really interesting you talk about listen before speaking um and you and i talked beforehand um walter brueggemann has a book in this series but he also his most uh, his best-selling book is The Prophetic Imagination. And one of the things he and I have talked about is he says in his tradition, which is UCC, he's very puzzled by the fact that people think prophetic preaching means scolding people. And he points out that all of the prophets turn to hope. And actually, the um, the, the first place that you get the phrase God of justice, it's, it's in Isaiah where it says, and now God's going to do great things to redeem you. It's not about scolding. So um, mm -hmm. that really fits with what you're describing. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Now, that does not mean that we don't have to sometimes call people out on hard things. I mean, the prophets definitely did that. Woe to you. Um, all of that is there too. And but you're right, and Brueggemann is right. It's always the emphasis is on hope. The emphasis is on the good news. And actually, I, I think I think that's one of the tripping points for a lot of preachers in forgetting that point, that part, whether they're trying to be prophetic or not. 
they use the sermon as an opportunity to say, here's all the things God wants you to do without beginning, ending, book ending somehow. Here's everything that God is giving us. And that's the mm. only way that we're able to do anything anyway. And so, yeah, of course, a prophetic claim sees the world in the way that maybe God's imagination is seeing it. And that will mean calling out bad behavior, but it also is about, it's more so about directing us to the goodness of God, which then does the calling out really for us. Uh, Mm. God can take care of that part, I think, in a lot of ways, if we Mm. just are helping to focus people's attention on the hope of what a new world order really is supposed to look like. That's great. At the at the end of that chapter, you offer a couple of blessings of sorts, Jennifer, and one of those blessings led me to uh, this question, and then we'll go to some of your sources of inspiration. But you write, may we as listeners have the curiosity to lean into the discomfort of not knowing, receiving disruption as an opportunity to grow our prophetic imagination. So as oh, as we as we engage your book and this topic, what would be one thing you would say to our listeners in terms of one step that they could grow into being a preacher of justice? What's one one thing you would want them to think about or remember or step they could take as they grow their own prophetic imagination? Yeah. Well, um One thing that I'm working on and I talk about in the book and I'm also doing some research on is I think um, it's three C's that I hope we're all working toward. And that's curiosity, creativity and courage. And I think Mm -hmm. one of those helps grow the other and they all three work together. And so I would say the first step, if you're interested in this, is just do something that scares you. Mm. (laughs) And I don't mean jump out of an airplane, although I suppose it could be, but it could be, um, if you're not an artist, draw something and share it with a person and talk about it and, or, um, find a spiritual discipline that is not familiar to you or makes you feel uncomfortable and just lean in for a little while. Mm -hmm. Um, go to places that are not your normal haunts, your normal neighborhoods, talk to people who you wouldn't normally talk to. And, don't be afraid to just try something and have it fail because we just have to practice. We just have to practice those things and you don't have to do it all from the pulpit. You know, that's, that's part of why we're do we're working all of this out for ourselves. So start, start with your own family, start with your own friends, start in a Bible study, start in a meeting, you know, rearrange the furniture, anything that can help <laughs> us start to just see a little bit differently. Jennifer, thanks so much for this uh, excellent first book. I'll look forward to more books from you in the future. Uh, um, <laughs> we have a few. Ge- we have two general questions about sources of inspiration, and the one I want to ask you is, uh, what's the hardest sermon you've ever preached, and how did you get through it? Well, I don't think there's ever a sermon that's not hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm not exactly sure how to pinpoint one. Um, there are, I would say the hardest sermons for me are the ones that where someone else has given me a text or someone else has said, here's kind of the theme and I'm just not, I'm not feeling it. Um, and so then I, I, I talk to other people and I, I talk to other people and I say, Hey, I'm supposed to talk about this thing. What does that make you think about? And I always, someone always points out some connection or some story or something that never would have occurred to me. And that sets off a a new pathway that I can go in. So again, it's that community thing. I just want to, I want to get input from other places and it gives me, Mm. stokes my ideas. Mm -hmm. And my question, Jennifer, is what are you reading now or have you read or do you read that 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 either nurtures your own preaching or fills you spiritually? Well, actually, I don't really read for that purpose because as a <laughs> professor and a pastor, like my whole life is about reading. And so when I need to be filled in a new way, 
I'm a creative, I'm a musician. I do probably more like the things that I was suggesting earlier. So I sit at the piano and I play or I sing or I pull a new song or I work in the garden or I try a new recipe or these things that maybe don't sound spiritual, but um, Mm. open me up, give me freedom to sort of hear, feel, process in a different way that is not looking at words, words, words all day long. So I got to get out of the books. That's how I do it. Jennifer. Our third interviewer uh, wants to correct you that there are not three C's, uh, creativity, um, curiosity, and uh, the fourth C is cats. (laughs) And at the podcast, would like to know what is your favorite animal and why is it a cat? Oh, (laughs) well, I'm sorry, uh, Bandit, but I'm actually allergic to cats. So no. I have to keep my distance, but you're a beautiful creature. I appreciate you very much. Do you have a different favorite animal? I think giraffes are pretty cool. They are. They are very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Bandit also wants to know what food you could eat every day. Pizza, if it is bougie (laughs) pizza, it has to be the bougie kind with like fancy, you know, homegrown herbs and weeds Mm -hmm. and stuff. One last question from Bandit. If you can't sleep on the computer keyboard, what's your favorite place to take a nap? Um, I have a chair in my bedroom that reclines just the exact right amount. And I have a pillow across my lap and probably uh, an iPad that is about to fall over as I fall asleep reclined there. Mm -hmm. That sounds pretty good right now. (laughs) well bandit thanks you jennifer as do we for being with us today thanks for listening to this episode of working preacher books podcast stay up to date on our conversation at at workingpreacher.org you can follow us on twitter facebook or instagram and find the latest in our working preacher book series at workingpreacher.org slash books thanks for joining us